So, we will continue discussion on um, usability testing and we will be discussing about various questionnaires that are being used as part of a measure to capture the data you know, after uh, the entire task completes or the entire session completes. So, what are the standardized questionnaires that are used or referred by user experience design practitioners or human computer interaction practitioners, we will discuss about that. Now, some of the most widely used and standardized questionnaires I have listed for all of you here in this slide. You can see the first one is the questionnaire for user interaction satisfaction that is called QUIS. Um, then the software usability measurement inventory SUMI. Uh, then uh, we have the post study system usability questionnaire which is called as PSSUQ and the system usability scale. So, out of this uh, four, uh, this one if you see uh, this is the one, two, uh, this is wrongly here given the number, this is the third and the fourth one. Okay. Now, um, out of this four uh, scales, uh, this one is the most widely used one, though all of them are widely used one, but this if you if you go to research papers and um, read research papers, you would see a lot of uh, researchers in this industry and in this field, they use the system usability scale by uh, Broke of uh, in which was uh, uh, published in 1996. Now, these standardized um, usability questionnaires are used for assessment of the perception of usability at the end of the study. So, these are all about perception, how, how do your user perceive uh, usability of a particular product about a particular activity that your concept is uh, providing with the users. And these are some of the standardized one. Now, uh, the, there are questionnaires which are intended for administration immediately following the completion of usability task also. Some of the uh, scales that we, have, we, we talked about after scenario uh, setting and also the entire test scenario. Uh, some of the are some of them are the after scenario questionnaire by Lewis, uh, expectation ratings, usability magnitude estimation, the single use question scenario uh, uh, questionnaire, and the subjective mental effort questionnaire. We will discuss about some of them in detail. Now, why are we harping on this thing, the word which is being used here, standardized? why we are talking about standardized usability questionnaire. Now, understand that the primary measures of standardized questionnaire quality are what? Reliability, that means consistency of measurement. Every time you are measuring, it should measure the same construct that for which it is intended to measure. And the next important parameter is validity measurement of the intended attribute or the construct. Now, there are several ways to assess reliability. Some of them include test retest and split half reliability. Now, the most common method for the assessment of reliability is coefficient alpha, which is also called as Cronbeck's alpha and which is a measurement of internal consistency of your questionnaire or the instrument. Now, coefficient alpha can range from 0 to 1. 0 means there is no reliability and 1 means perfect reliability. So, a good standard a questionnaire generally has the range from 0.75 to 0.8 or 0.7, that is an ideal range in which your Cronbach's alpha would uh, uh, rely on. Now, one of the important aspect which you need to understand here is that we are talking about quantitative parameters. All these instruments, all these questionnaires that are being discussed, these are questionnaires that capture data as a quantitative value. We are not capturing data as qualitative parameter and therefore, we can then measure the what we talk about the internal consistency which is the reliability of your instrument. 
Now, if your instrument is not reliable, what will happen is that every time you go and conduct a test and you use these questionnaires, it would not provide you with the same measure again and again. So, if you are, if the questionnaire is about uh, measurement of perceived usability at a certain mo at a certain point of time it can measure the perceived usability while in a different uh, uh, test or a situation it might measure something else so then if it does not measure over the period of time the same in internal attribute then there is an issue in consistency of its measurement and that is what we call as reliability issue and this is measured by Cronbach's alpha now, a questionnaire's validity, now coming down to validity, it is the extent to which it measures what it claims to measure. That means, if, if, if you have a questionnaire that measures the perceived, perceived usability, the questionnaire must measure perceived usability. If, if, you, if you have designed a questionnaire that um, captures or measures, you know, memorability, if it captures um, uh, preferences or something like that, it must capture that construct for which it is being designed and that is what we call as validity, the extent to which it measures what it claims to measure. Right? Now, there are several distinct approaches to measure validity of a instrument or a questionnaire. The first one is the content validity. Now, content validity depends on a rational, it is a subjective evaluation and therefore, it is uh, not empirical in nature. It is a rational assessment of where the items came from. Now, typically content validity is assumed if the items were created by domain experts. So, somebody who has worked in the area of usability, they know uh, the measures, the constructs, the parameters or the kind of questions that can be asked to measure usability uh, or, or the, these questions are selected from a literature review of existing questionnaires in the target or the related do domains. If that is the case, then we say that the content validity has been achieved or addressed. The next one is the criteria related validity. Now, criteria related validity refers to the relationship between the measure of the interest. So, this is the parameter and a different concurrent or predictive measure. You know, So, it is a, a comparison or an assessment between these two parameters that has been conducted. So, typically it is assessed with the Pearson correlation coefficient. Now, these correlations do not have to be large to provide evidence of validity. Now, for example, say personal selection instruments with validities as low as 0.3 or 0.4 can be large enough to justify their use, right? This is called criteria related validity. The third one is construct validity. Now, construct validity refers to the extent to which the item selected for a questionnaire align with underlying constructs that the questionnaire was designed to assess. So, questionnaire developers use statistical procedures like primarily factor analysis to discover or confirm these clusters of the related items. Right? So, when items cluster together in a reasonable or an expected way, this is not only evidence of construct validity, but also is the basis of forming reasonable subscales, which we will uh, talk about in detail in subsequent slides. Now, high correlations between measurements believed to tap into the same construct are evidence of convergent validity. That means, if some of the param sub parameters say p 1, p 2, if some of these uh, uh, sub parameters are being seen as correlated, then we can conclude by saying that um, the same there is an evidence for convergent validity means they are converging towards a particular construct. Right? So, low correlations between variables that are not expected to measure the same construct are evidence of divergent validity. So, both ways the validities can be 
measured. So, construct validity can be measured both ways using convergent validity like the sub parameters are directly are getting correlated with the other parameters or we are using an opposite construct and looking at whether these constructs are uh, or the, the study suggests whether there is any divergent correlation that means they are not at all correlated and there is a divergence in terms of the parameters uh, that are under investigation and that is an evidence of uh, divergent validity. So, lo low co correlations sometimes this is often uh, referred to as discriminant validity as well. So, measurement of validity what we have understood is can be carried out in, in three ways. One is the content validity that is primarily rational in nature, it is not empirical or quantitative. The, the second one is criteria related validity which can be assessed by the Pearson's uh, coefficient. Then the third one is a construct validity which is based on how other sub parameters tend to correlate with the major parameter in terms of their correlation activity. So, therefore, if there is a high correlation we talk it we say that there is a uh, evidence of convergent uh, validity. If there is low correlation then we uh, of, of different construct of constructs that we know that are not related then it is an evidence of divergent uh, validity which is also called as discriminant validity. Now, coming down to uh, finally, covering all the major aspects of your uh, research design of how do you uh, conceive a usability test scenario, one of the fundamental parameters that are of concern and that would let you know the kind of tests that you are going to do is based on the type of data. Now, when we talk about type of data, we mean what? We mean that the scales that you are using or that the construct that you are measuring, it has a particular set of value and that value can be classified or categorized into four different types and these are nominal data, ordinal data, interval data and ratio data. A majority of the time, interval and ratio can be clubbed together and be called as a scale data. Now, what is the nominal data? So, numbers that are simply levels for example, you have a jersey number or uh, you know uh, that are uh, also called categorical in nature. So, nominal data is also called categorical in nature and these are simply unordered groups or categories different types of users such as windows versus mac users, users in different uh, geographic locations or males versus females these are examples of nominal data. Then you have ordinal data. Now, numbers that have an order for example, your roll number but the intervals between the measurements are not meaningful. So, when we say that what is the interval between roll number 1 and roll number 2, we cannot ascertain that the same interval exists between all these uh, roll numbers. right? So, examples ordinal data come from self reported data. For example, a user might rate a website as excellent, good, fair or poor. Now, we have no idea the intervals between uh, excellent and good or good and fair or fair or poor. Now, these are relative rankings. The distance between excellent and good is not necessarily the same distance between good and fair and therefore, these are called ordinal data, but they can be ranked. So, if you rank it can be excellent, good, fair or poor. So, though it can be ranked the intervals between them are not consistent in nature, but in case of nominal data it can't be ranked as well. You can't rank between gender males or females. right? The next one is called the interval data. Now, in interval data are continuous data that where differences between the values are meaningful in nature. Now, if you remember in the last one we talked about categorical data and continuous data. Continuous data means what? The data where these differences, these intervals are meaningful. That means, the, 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 the interval between 1 to 2 is same as 2 to 3 or 3 to 4 right? and therefore, these are called as continuous data, but there is no natural 0 point. 
So, an example of interval data familiar to most of us is, is the concept of temperature. Now, when we talk about say temperature like 0 degree Celsius or 32 degree Fahrenheit, which is based on what water freezes is completely arbitrary. It is a it has a frame of reference right. So, the freezing point of water does not mean uh, the absence of heat, it only identifies a meaningful point on the scale of temperatures, but the differences between the values are meaningful. The distance from 10 degree to 20 degree is the same as the distance between uh, from 20 degree to 30 degree using either of the scales, either you use the uh, Celsius scales or the Fahrenheit scales. Now, dates are another common example of interval data and in usability, the system usability scale, which we talked about as one of the most highly used scales, uh, most popular among all the scales that are being used by user experience designers and HCI designers is an example of an interval data. The last one is ratio data. Now, what is the ratio data? So, ratio data are the same as interval data, but the addition of an absolute 0. So, the concept of absolute 0 exists. It is not in terms of the frame of reference that we had in case of an interval data. This means that 0 is value is not arbitrary in nature as with the interval data, but has some inherent meaning. So, with the ratio data, differences between the measurements are interpreted as ratio. Examples ratio data are age, height, weight, right. In each example, 0 indicates the absence of age or the absence of height or the absence of weight. Now, these are the classifications of uh, the different types of data that would let us understand what kind of measurement or analysis techniques we need to proceed based on the interpretation of the type of data from our skills. Now, in user experience, the most obvious example of ratio data is time. Okay? So, 0 seconds left to complete a task would mean no time duration remaining. So, ratio data let you say something is twice as fast or half as slow as something else is in reference to an arbit, not an arbitrary data, but an absolute data which we talk about as 0. That means, nothing is left. So, for example, you could say that one user is twice as fast as another user in completing a task. So, having understood all these types of data, now what is important is to understand the concepts of de descriptive statistics and how you compare between two different groups. Now, when we talk about descriptive statistics, now it is, it is essential to understand that for any interval or, or uh, ratio level data, descriptive statistics, reporting descriptive statistics is important. Now, descriptive statistics as the name implies, you know, it describes the data it tells you about the data without saying anything about the larger population. See, we have, we have collected some samples from the population and we are trying to understand that our samples represent our population. So, whatever we do or test or is being provided as feedback by our samples, uh, we will be able to gauge how the situation would exist in the population. Right? So, inferential statistics let you draw some conclusions or infer something about larger population above and beyond your sample. So, while descriptive statistics allows us to understand about the nature of the sample, uh, using samples to extrapolate uh, the population parameter is what we, con we term as the concept of inferential statistics. It allows us to infer about the population parameter. And some of the ways through which we use inferential statistics are measures of central tendency. So, measures of central tendency are simply a way of choosing a single number that is in some way representative of, of a set of numbers. So, the three main most common references or measures of central tendency are the mean, median and mode. And remember that which measure of central tendency would you consider? would depend on the type of data that we have just talked about, nominal, ordinal, interval or ratio. So, measures of variability. 
Now, measures of variability reflect how much the data is spread. See, if you remember, we had a discussion earlier that when you collect this kind of interval or ratio data, these data ideally should be distributed like this and this is called the normal distribution or the bell shaped curve. Right? Now, this is called a distribution and a bell shaped curve. So, the measures of variability reflect how much the data is spread, this spread, this entire spread from where it started and where it went, this entire spread is the is what variability talks about. Right? So, for example, these measures help answer the question, do most users have similar task completion times or is there a wide range of times? if we are measuring task completion times. In most usability studies, variability is caused by individual differences. That means, the psychological constructs among your participants and there are three common measures of variability. One is the range, one is the variance and the other one is the standard deviation. So, the three uh, common measures of variability is range, variance and the standard deviation. Now, in usability testing, you know, uh, we almost never have access to the entire user population because the user population is really large enough. So, instead what we have to do is we have to rely on taking samples to estimate the unknown population values. So, if we want to know how long it will take users to complete a task or, or, or what percent will complete a task on the first attempt, we need to estimate from our samples that are representative of our population parameters. So, the sample means and the sample proportions which are called the statistic are estimates of the values that we really want, uh, which we want as something that we call as population parameters. Now, in, in this case, confidence interval plays a major role. So, when we do not have access to the entire population, even our best estimate from a sample will be close, but not exactly right. We cannot pinpoint a number that our, our mean in the population will lie here. That is absolutely not possible. So, in, in that case and the smaller sample size, the less accurate it will be. So, we need to know how good or precise our estimates are. So, to do so, we construct a range of values that we think will have a specified chance of containing the unknown population parameter and these ranges are called confidence intervals. The more uh, 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 big your confidence interval is, the higher chance that there is a concept of error or the, an error that has happened in your experimental studies. Now, a confidence interval is an estimate of a range of values that includes the true population value of a statistic such as the mean. So, it means that in this range that is being given from you from, from your statistical uh, analysis, the, inside that range the true uh, mean of the population parameter will lie. That is what we are predicting. Now, comparing means one of the most useful things you can do with the interval or ratio data is to compare different means. If you want to know whether one design has higher satisfaction ratings than other or if the number of errors is higher for one group of users compared to other, the best approach is using two groups and measuring their means. Now, let us come down to the concept, the system usability scale that we have just referred to, which is used extensively in this domain. Now, the most well known question here used in UX research or HCI research is the system usability scale. The system usability scale has been around uh, since 1980s and um, it was later formally defined by Brook also and has been repeatedly demonstrated as an experimentally to be highly valid and reliable. It was, it was invented by John Brook at uh, Digital Equipment Corporation and the system usability scale is a post test instrument which is given to participant after an entire usability testing session is over. Right? So, uh, in this slide you can see the example of the system usability scale and the, and the questionnaire, the test items. The SUS is a 
series of 10 Likert scale questions and produces a score from 0 to 100. So, for your site's usability to be in the top 10 percent of all sites, you need to have a score of 80 or higher, whereas a score of 73 would place you only in the top 30 percent. That is the statistic we have from literatures. Now, we also talked about the single ease question, which is a post task satisfaction uh, scale. Now, in contrast to the uh, system usability scale, post task questionnaires are administered at the end of every task in a test session and they are useful for uh, primarily two main reasons and the reasons are that they allow you to compare which parts of your interface are perceived as most problematic since you collect this data after every task. Right. So, since the task itself just concluded, it is fresh in the participant's mind and therefore, she is more able to provide a clear indication of her attitude towards the experience without subsequent tasks coloring her memory. Now, this is an example of the single ease question, which is post task satisfaction score. So, it is only uh, one item score and uh, it can let you understand about the specific task that has been exposed to, uh, to the user. The other uh, questionnaire that we would discuss a little bit in detail is the NASA task load index. Now, the NASA task load in index is an uh, scale that is used to capture the post task workload of, of the users. So, the NASA TLX which is um, abbreviated as TLX for task load index is an example of post task questionnaire that is useful for studying complex products and tasks in healthcare, aerospace, military and in uh, and high consequence environments. So, the it emerged in 1980 from as a result of NASA's efforts to develop an instrument of for measuring the perceived workload, working load on the working memory required by the complex highly technical task of aerospace crew members, but this can be used as extensively in HCI and UX to measure task load of the given tasks that, that we have designed and to see how easy it is for our user to remember certain uh, information while they are uh, progressing towards their uh, goal. Now, the NASA task load index contains 6 questions that users must answer on an unlabeled 21 point scale ranging from very low to very high. Each question addresses one dimension of the perceived workload like mental demand, physical demand, time pressure, perceived success with the task, overall effort level and frustration level. After this initial assessment, users weigh each one of the six categories. They just completed to indicate which category mattered most to what they were doing. So, it is a complete complex instrument to score, but NASA has released a free online scoring of the uh, task load index as well. It, it has a free iOS application. It is also available in some online interface where you can use the ratings to calculate the final task load and that makes the calculation procedure a little bit easier. Now, what you see in this slide is an example of the task load index questionnaire. What you see, it, it focuses on mental demand, physical demand, temporal demand, performance, effort and frustrations. And based on the evaluations of your users, the final task load uh, index is being calculated. Now, this comes to the end of our uh, lecture on uh, the last module for this course. After this, you will uh, be exposed to one of the case studies given by one of my PhD scholars on healthcare and that would demonstrate the steps, the procedures that have been covered uh, to ensure that a requirement that has been defined by the designer it is addressed based on this nature of the context and specific um, instructions, uh, which is highly contextual because in this case a healthcare is a very complex in, in uh, context. So, you would realize the kind of decisions making, the kind of um, complex situations that the de designer faces in addressing this requirements. Thank you.